Paul and Silas had a chain breaking anointing. The Bible says they were chained to the walls of the inner dungeon. And they sang so loud that the prisoners on the outside heard them. What many of us are after is that anointing that breaks the chains. But what you do at 1159 determines what happens at midnight. A lot of people want that high anointing on their life. But the most important thing is you have to make a decision. What will I do at 1159 when I don't know what 12 is going to bring? Look at me. I want you to know that you're in a place where God is molding you. And what Pastor Ashton said just a second ago is so relevant and so deep. You have to understand that praise can be done anywhere, but worship to get to the inner courts, you had to pass a veil that was held by five pillars. In other words, you can't go into the inner courts. You can't go into the inner courts unless you get truthful. Five represents grace and it represents truth. There's a five-fold ministry that brings truth to us. We know that. You've learned that here probably many times have heard that. But to, to be a worshiper, you got to worship beyond the props, man. You got to be able to worship if there's no music playing. You got to worship if the B3 is not there and the drums aren't kicking and the piano's not playing. When you get to that place, that's when it becomes genuine, authentic worship. Authentic. So I want you to lift your hands. And you who are watching online, I want you to do the same. One thing I can tell you is there is a transfer and there is a way of feeling through the airwaves. Every time I've watched Valor College online or this church, you can feel the presence of God come through. I want you to give God an authentic worship. The fruit of your lips giving him your praise. The first time worship was mentioned in the Bible, it was not a song. The first time worship was mentioned in the Bible, Abraham brought his son Isaac to the mountain and he said, everybody stay here. Me and the lad are going to go yonder and worship. Worship is not a song. It is a sacrifice. So when you worship, it's got to be from another place than just singing. It's got to be a place of sacrifice. And sacrifice is a place that hurts. So you've got to be able to move beyond what makes you feel good and give something to God. God wants you to play. Worship is literally giving something to Him that means something to you. And I want us to do something before we move on any further. I have been where you are. World Harvest Church, Viola College, Pastor Delan and I. I can't tell you how much I would love to go back and just relive those moments. Because you can very quickly forget where you are. Because that which is precious becomes common. It becomes replaceable. So these moments right here are precious. You don't realize it because time is moving so fast. And a couple of years later, you'll be moved out. You'll be doing something. You might be in a ministry or something. But there's moments that God just sits and dwells and just hovers. And I feel that moment right now. And I want you to close your eyes. I want you to lift your hand. And I want you to take about two minutes. That's all. Two minutes beyond the props. You let them play some pad. But I want you to worship the Lord the way you worship the Lord. It has to register, though. Open your mouth and worship the Lord. Take a moment. Take a moment. Hallelujah. 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 
Just, just elevate that pad if you could. This is where David found his strength. And there was nobody else around and it was him and God on the backside of the desert. Man, nobody picked him but God. And he got picked because he was a worshiper. Worship is not about a gift. It's about giving yourself to him. Just take a moment and give yourself to him. Everything in your life will change when you become a worshiper. Hallelujah. Come on, elevate your worship. Just bring it up. We worship you, Lord. We magnify your name. There's none like you, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise your name, God. You're worthy to be worshipped and adored. Let your presence fill every single person here today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your name. Oh, yes, Lord. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. Make it vertical. Come on, sing it. y'all feel that presence? Lift your hands if you feel it. Worship is so vertical. Sing it to him. Come on and sing it out. I exalt. Come on, just lift it up. I want you to sing. Come on, you to sing. Say it. Hi. Come 
soul, sing it out. I exalt the Lord. Now go with your hands, open your mouth, and exalt him, extol him, adore him, magnify him, lift him up. Come on, give him your best praise. Come on, Valor College. Give me your best. Hallelujah. Well. I got a feeling, I got a feeling we could stay there all day if we wanted to. Because people in here want to be here. I feel like this is a bunch of giant slaying people. And I want to, I want, I just want to talk to y'all a little bit. I want to maybe just bring some stuff to you today that I've learned. Pastor Glenn and I have learned. And so I do want to teach a little bit and then see what God has. So how many would like to just um, receive some word today before we move any further? Yeah. I really believe, um, I'll never forget my chapel experiences. You know, I preached my first sermon in chapel. You know what it was? It was back when, you know, it was, man, I'm telling you, uh, it was back when it was Dominion Hall. And I preached, I was 20, 19 years old, and I preached the scripture like a hammer that breaks the rocks into pieces so shall your word be that goes forth out of your mouth and uh pastor parsley kept saying you can't touch this uh last night and I, it made me think my first message was called it's hammer time now that was back when mc hammer was real big and uh just to think you know you don't be defined by your first message because <laughs> you will literally uh, when you look back, you think, my goodness, that was the most silliest message. But you know what? You got to start somewhere. And you're here absorbing and learning. And some of you are paying a great price to be here. And can I tell you, it will be worth every penny of it. Monetarily, time, it will be worth every penny of it. So I don't know how you transition to get back people back to their seats. But I want you to just hug about four people and tell them you love them. And brother, you can just stay with me a little bit. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Why don't you turn your Bibles? Get your Bibles out. And I want you to put it to Exodus. And, f and five then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river and her maidens walked along the riverside and when she saw the ark amongst the reeds she sent her maid to get it and when she opened it she saw a child 
and behold the baby wept so she had compassion on him and said this is one of the Hebrews children she saw a child and the baby wept everybody say the baby wept Moses's first talk his first communication to anybody was crying and I want to talk to you about preaching today I want to talk to you about the anatomy of a deliverer because I believe that we are in a house full of deliverers today and I believe you're here because God has called you to be different you are a deliverer you're in a house of preaching and so I think it's very very under very very important we understand the DNA that you are being imparted into I want us to pray father I thank you for taking this next few moments and anointing it teach preach do whatever you want to do through me I want to give you the praise and glory and I want to thank you God for giving me the opportunity to minister to giant slayers here and I give you all the praise and glory and everybody shout amen if you believe you're a giant slayer, would you give God a great shout of praise? Um, thank you, sir. Thank you. I, um, Delan and I, as you know, we met here. What a wonderful place to have, have meet your, your, your significant other. Um, I don't know how they look at it still. I think they don't want, I, I, we weren't supposed to be dating back then. I don't know how that works, but I'd rather find my wife at a college like this than in a bar across the street or down the, you know, down the road. Um, and God put us together. And for 20 years, we, get to, we got to experience everything that we were trained here to do. We got to experience ministry. And I think, and pardon me with my little bit of congestion here, but ministry sometimes can get a misdiagnosis. A lot of us think ministry is a stage. We define ministry by that. That's a platform to do ministry through. But the word ministry is diakonos. Diakonos means to do menial and insignificant tasks. In God's eyes, you're doing ministry when you're not seen. Paul said it in 1 Corinthians. He said, God made the body kind of like he made ministry. The parts that are seen, you can lose them and still live. But the parts that are not seen, if you lose them, you can't live. We misdiagnose ministry as singing and preaching. We, we, that's not the fullness of ministry. That's part of ministry. You can't have that without the other. But the truth is, is ministry is doing menial and insignificant tasks. It's doing stuff that nobody else wants to do. There's not a lot of glory in ministry. So if you're after glory, you're in the wrong house. Because God says, I will not share my glory with anybody else. And so to have the basic understanding of being a minister, I have to have a very good understanding of what ministry is. Because your gift does not bless God. Your gift makes a way for you. Your faith blesses God. And your worship brings him in. So when you have a gift, be careful to think that your identity comes from your gift. Because your gift is making a way for you. But if you try to get yourself identified by your gift, then you'll have to continue to use your gift to do and to stay where you are and you become disposable when you're not using your gift. That's why you don't fall in love with your gift. You fall in love with God. 
And when you fall in love with God, ladies and gentlemen, I don't care if you're scrubbing toilets, you're greeting at the front door, I don't care if you're over ministry and nobody sees you, or you're wiping babies, boot, butts. I don't know if that's the right word to say, I'm sorry. But ministry is not what you think it is. Ministry is doing whatever God asked you to do. I wish somebody would have told me because I come out of World Office Bible College ready to change the world. And I found out that changing the world meant driving a bus down to small street where people were hurting in pain. And I thought, well, you may not know small street, but in Gallatin, Tennessee, that's a very difficult street. And I thought we we're going to change the world. And, and God wants you to change the world, but he wants you to change your world. God said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The number one thing you have to have in ministry is a repentative heart. And repentative, if you look up the definition of that, is to rethink. So you got to rethink for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Change your thought process of why you're here. You are in boot camp. Boot camp is when everything is stripped off of you. Your mindset, you can't go home to mama anymore, but you got to leave that and go into something that God's called you to do. Boot camp takes away all of your negative mindsets about you and reinstalls in you what you have been enlisted in so that you can please the one who enlisted you, not the one that you're preaching to. I want to talk to you about the anatomy of a deliverer. I, don't want, you, I, want, to just, I want you to write this down. Number one, you must know. You must know that you are called. You must know that you are called. Everybody say, I know. I am called. And I want to tell you why. Because on, on the outside, ministry looks so awesome until you get involved into the true identity of ministry. And then there come struggles and in those struggles, if you don't know you're called, you'll be identified by your struggle. Man identifies you by your struggle. They said that's blind Bartimaeus. That was his struggle. The woman with the issue of blood. Man defines you by your struggle. Here's what God does, and here's why you're at Valor College. Because God defines you in your struggle. Very different. Man will look at you and define you by your struggle. God will use your struggle to give you your identity. Joseph was a dreamer. God gave him that identity. Even Jesus understood. Is this all right, y'all? Even Jesus understood and said to his people, his disciples, he says, who do men say that I am? And they said, well, some of you, all, you know, they think you're Elijah. They think you're uh, John the Baptist. They think this, they think that. And here's what his question was to everybody. Who do you say I am? Number one, you got to know you're called. Number two, you got to know your identity. Even Jesus questioned, and everybody got silent. His closest companions, his disciples, could not identify him. And Peter spoke up, one out of 11, spoke up and said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And this is what he said, blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. In other words, he's saying this. Thank you, because my identity will never come from man. This is the anatomy of a deliverer. Your identity will never come from a man. They will identify with you in your success. But your identity does not come from man. Your identity comes from God. And Jesus said, 
blessed are you for flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you but my father in heaven you've got to allow God to identify you and that's why you're at valor college because man will say you're this man will say you're that but you got to sit and say God I don't care what they say I want to know what you say God puts a DNA in you style is inept DNA is innate and you can't change who you are I don't care how you try to dress it up make it up I don't care you can't be somebody else either you got to be you the most important valuable thing is ain't nobody else gonna be another Miles Rutherford on the face of this earth I better make it good this is just flesh you're looking at God gave this body to me and gave me a destiny just like he gave every single one of you but your identity you are called by God and number two you must know your identity everybody say I gotta know who I am I gotta know who I am because if you don't know who you are you won't know what to do because when you're trying so busy to be somebody else the problem is is God never anointed you to do what they do so God puts you in a, in, a, in a holding place right here and he begins to pour into you and start telling you exactly who you are. The best thing you could do is continue. There's a time of weariness that comes on every single person in Bible college. I remember those times. You, it's like, my God, why am I here? Because God wants you to continue. You got to continue. You got a lot that God has anointed for you out there, but you got to be in here. Your mind, I'm not just saying your, your body, your mind. Because you got to get into your next season first in your mind. Your mind is where your identity comes from. You got to think yourself. Everybody say, I have an identity. Because what happens is, it's just like, just like diamonds. <clears throat> diamonds are not formed in coal. Diamonds are found in coal. Diamonds are formed by pressure. So the more pressure you're going through, the more brilliant you become. You're not found amongst other diamonds. You're found in a bunch of coal. In other words, you got a lot of junk on you. There's a lot of flesh in us. But there's something in you. That's the reason why Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a man who goes to a field and he finds something in the field. He goes back, he sells everything he has to get to the place to, so he can purchase what's in the field. Sometimes you got to buy all the junk in order to get the gold in the field. God redeemed you, not because of your flesh and your junk, because he's seen something valuable in you. He's seen an identity in you and he did not define you by your coal. He defines you by your brilliance, your diamonds. God never comes to you and talks to you about your junk. God always comes to you and identifies you of who he calls you out to be. He came to Gideon. He said, rejoice, mighty man of valor. He was no mighty man of valor. He was threshing. He was hiding. He was the shortest. He was the smallest. He said, I call you mighty man of valor. God will never, ever speak to you about where you've been. He will always speak to you about what you are and where you're going. Rejoice, mighty man, woman of valor. Everybody shout, I'm a man, a woman of valor. He says, go in this might of yours. He's like, what might are you talking about? I'm just a little small puny thing I'm the weakest of Manessa God chose the weakest because God doesn't need what we think he needs to do what he wants to do God will always choose something other than everybody else he will always choose people who are loyal and faithful God doesn't choose gifts he chooses loyalty God doesn't choose strength he chooses faithfulness and the, learn, the quicker I learned that, the stronger I became in my faith because I realized that my identity is not what everybody else says I am, but my identity came from God. And even Jesus understood this. And everybody that's a deliverer, you're going to have to understand this. Stop trying to be seeking to be understood. There's a lot of people that ain't going to understand the fire inside of you. 
They're not going to understand the gift inside of you. They're not going to understand what God has invested inside of you. You're not there to tell them about. You're there to tell them about God, not try to be understood by them. Too many of us will preach and sing while we side-eye to see if they're going to respond. We'll do ministry to see how the response. God doesn't call you to get a response. He calls you to get a result. Deliverers are not here on the earth to get response. They're on the earth to get results. And Moses cried. I love this because Moses cries in, in Exodus 2, 6. And the people cry in Exodus 2 and 23. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, that the children of Israel groaned because of their bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. Everybody say, there is a people crying. I want you to see this. God had a deliverer crying before the people ever cried out. Before a people needed deliverance, God was raising up a deliverer. You really don't have a clue what God has on the other side of this. There are people attached that don't even know they're attached to the ministry God's going to do through you. That's why you can't play. Some of y'all got back from spring break and some of y'all like, dear God, I need, to, I, need, I need to repent. You can't play in Bible college, ladies and gentlemen. Because there's a deliverance anointing that God's putting in you. Because there's a people that needs deliverance that they don't even know they need deliverance. I found this out very strongly that God was putting me through some tests and trials and tribulations and, and, tr and really I thought, well, well, God, why are you going and doing something? I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about testing because everybody gets testing and sin mixed up. Sin is a choice. Test is from God. Taste and see is when you get to test God. But when God tests you, it's not about seeing God. It's about shifting you. So God will test you to see that's why you may be going through some tests is because God wants to see can I trust you because he can't trust you in the test he's not gonna be able to trust you when you go and minister and bring people out and so he takes a Moses and as I think this is very and I just want to stop and talk about this I know you this 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 house speaks on this quite often is abortion Moses was being raised up and they were killing babies. Jesus, when he was born, they set out a decree to kill babies. Every time God raises up deliverers, the nation goes to killing babies. We think that it's just a law that's being passed, but it's a satanic attack what does the devil see in you that you can't even see in yourself? The devil was killing babies when Moses was born and Moses was born before there was even a need for a deliverer and they cried out and God said, I already got a deliverer. Jesus was the same way. The moment he was born, they started killing babies because the devil understood that there's a deliverer in the nation right now. And if they've been killing babies for the last 15, 20 years, it could be an indication that there's some deliverers in this house today. That's why you're here. That's why you made it. And that's why you have to cry out. Preaching is about crying. Don't underestimate. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a deliverer. You're a deliverer. 
you got to know. I want you to say this. I want you to write this down. Deliverers must only say. Say it out loud. Deliverers must only say what God wants them to say. I don't think Moses really wanted. As a matter of fact, the Bible says it. Moses really did not want to be a deliverer. He said, can you let somebody else go? I really don't want this. this, this. It's amazing how many people will come up to us in ministry and say, I'm minister so-and-so, and, and I know how to preach and all that. And, and I'm like, sit down. Can you, can you wash a toilet first? Because if they have to announce it with a badge, chances are they aren't. Moses could only say what God said. He said, what do I say? He just tell them to let my people go. What was that? What if that was the only message God gave you? Because deliverers can only say what God said. You can't say just to make everybody feel good because that's the dispensation that we have dealt with for 20 years. I just want to say something to make you feel good, to make you keep coming. That's why you're here, because God wants you to say what he wants to say. Because if you don't say what God says, and you're constantly making sure you say what the people want you to say, then you can't confront because you're too confused. Confused people will not confront. And you cannot conquer what you don't confront. Confused people cannot be deliverers I don't know maybe maybe I, hopefully I'm not out of place by saying this but I we've been having church on Sunday nights quite often for the last two and a half years and it gave us the opportunity to go to some houses of worship on Sunday mornings and you know you want to go and you're thinking man I'm gonna go experience some other houses and I didn't realize how bad things have gotten when I show up and the pre-service is Cardi B. Oh, maybe that didn't get a lot of shouts because you all listen to Cardi B. I don't know. Little Wayne. Well, we need to pray for them. Yes, we need to pray for them. But we don't need to play them. You got Beyonce, all this wonderful music. Pre we're trying to get people to feel good about themselves, to get them in the house so that we can reach them. You cannot deliver people from what you're giving to. Deliverers draw a line. We can't deliver people what, what we, can't, we, can't, we can't deliver them from if we're giving it to them. That's why Moses, God, he was so frustrated and he killed a man and he fleed to Midian and God had him in the wilderness for 40 years. That was his ministry, wilderness ministry, wilderness ministry. And he was there and didn't realize what he was doing, but he was just there because God was forming him and giving him his identity in the wilderness. The wilderness is exactly where Jesus was pushed. The Spirit of the Lord led him to the wilderness. We think the Spirit of the Lord leads us to a platform. No, the first place he leads you to is a wilderness. The wilderness is where he tempts and tests and gets everything out of you that needs to get out of you. Moses was in a wilderness. Elijah was in a wilderness. Jesus was in a wilderness. And John the Baptist came out of a wilderness. What if your what if your platform was not a big shiny place with big lights? What if it was a dirt floor and out in the middle of nowhere, but you had an anointing to preach and God made you a crier? That's what John the Baptist was and that's what we are today. He's a voice in the wilderness crying out, prepare 
ye the way. Make straight the past. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason why God is picked you and chose you is because he's preparing you. You cannot plan for God. You have to prepare the way for God. And God is raising up deliverers in Valor College. God is raising up people that will speak for him and represent him and not just speak to the people, but speak for him. If you don't speak for him, how is God's word going to come forth? Let them have dominion. When God made mankind, he made us have dominion. He said, let them. Everybody say me. Let them. Everybody say me. I have dominion. Who has dominion? Who has dominion on earth? Say, I have dominion. God said, let them. Let them. Satan heard it because God gave dominion to mankind and stepped back. So you had to have a body to have dominion on the earth. So if anything is going to be done on the earth, it's going to be because we have a body. God is a spirit. He withdrew himself and said, let them. He didn't say let us. He said, let them. So if anything's going to be done on this earth, God is going to raise up somebody in the flesh that he can partner with and say, God, and, and God will minister through and to and use you as a deliverer. God will only do what you allow him to do because God can call you, but he cannot create your capacity. God calls you, but you create your capacity callings are from God capacity is your determination if you want capacity to change you gotta allow the pressure of God to mold you it's only when you get on a wheel and the wheel starts turning and his hand starts forming and he pushes down a little harder and creates a capacity in you you gotta have capacity and I don't know what your capacity is, but you determine your capacity. Because any the, the, anytime God tests you, it's to create a different capacity. Deliverers have to carry a capacity. The only way you can get a capacity is to allow God to put some pressure on you. Put his thumb on you. Put you on a wheel. Spin you around. Frustrate your plans. We shout no weapon form last night so well. But if you back it up two scriptures, it says God created the blacksmith who created the weapon so that he can say no weapon formed against you. So it was really never the devil in the first place. God had it all under control. God created the blacksmith who created the weapon so he can say no weapon form. So everything that's happening in your life, every weapon form, God actually created it and he knew it would not avail. He did it to create a capacity. Capacity is one of the greatest keys that you can have as a believer of Christ. But I learned very quickly, if I want great capacity, I got to stand the pressure. Deliverers have to go through. Sometimes it may be 40 days. Sometimes it could be 40 years. But it's really not a time limit. It's an attitude. God sees your attitude shift and change. And all of a sudden, he creates a different capacity. And you can only get great capacity by pressure. Everybody say, God, put some pressure on me. Some of you are very uncomfortable because God has pressure on you. My grandmother cooked two different ways. She cooked with a crock pot and a pressure cooker. Could cook the same thing in two different ways. The crock pot, you'd put it on in the morning. Anybody ever had a crock pot? You know what I'm talking about? You put that roast in there. Put them potatoes and them vegetables and all that wonderful stuff. Mmm. Y'all feel the anointing on that right there? Some of y'all got one of them crock pots at home right now just, just cooking and just marinating. You throw those seasonings in it and <clears throat> you can put it in at 8 o'clock. By 4 o'clock, it's finally done. It took from 8 to 4. All that time to cook. <clears throat> I found something else out. My grandma would have this thing, old school pressure cookers. The old school pressure cookers, you, you lock the lid, put the same stuff in there, you turn the heat on, and this little thing will go shh. Y'all know, know what I'm talking about? Y'all have a grandma like that? The same meal that would take from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. to cook, my grandma could do it in one hour. Why? 
because she would lock a lid, turn the heat on, allow the pressure to build up, and you could expedite the meal a lot faster. What am I saying? Some of you are here because God is putting some pressure on you because he's trying to speed up something in you that you would take years to do on your, my God, I feel the anointing in this place. You would take years to do it, but he puts you at Valor College to put an anointing and an impartation on you and you could get that through a small amount of pressure and he creates a new capacity. Ever say, God changed my capacity. So important that you say, God, change me through valor college get out of me everything that i thought i was going to be and make me what you want me to be my daughter who's here she's getting married to to a great man of god y'all put your hand stand up brooklyn she's getting married stand up kendall this man of god is so powerful i got such a wonderful family pastor land and i and um, she said, she said, Dad, I'm getting married. And uh, come up here. I'm going to brag on you all a little bit. She said, Dad, I'm getting married. And she's got the most beautiful smile. And she said, I just, I just want to put something on, you know, just to make sure everything's all nice and straight. So when I get married, I said, well, baby, the, those braces take years. Years. You know, sometimes you go, to the, you go there and you say, um, it's going to take two years. You're going to have to really, you have to let, let that happen. So... The, the next question that you ask is, can I get it done any faster? Anybody ever had braces? You know what I'm talking about. And here's the next question they ask. How much pain are you able to withstand? Because if you can stand the pain, we can come in here every week and twist a little harder and cause those things to straighten up and I'll have you out here in six months. But the truth is, is nobody really does it in six months because the pain is so great. What are you asking God to do? Thank you. What are you asking God to do? Because if you're willing to stand, whatever you're asking God to do, first of all, he's going to do above and beyond what you can ask or think. But be careful what you ask for. Because God will do what you want him to do, but it may requires some things that you got to walk through and some stuff you got to let go of and some comments you got to delete and some people you got to let rid of because if he's going to create capacity in you and change you he's going to tweak you tweak and test and 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 put you through some stuff and and nobody shouts on that kind of stuff you, you'll shout later I said, you'll shout later. You'll be excited about it because you'll be like, I know I would not be where I am today if it had not been for God doing all those things in my life. It's hard to shout beforehand. It's better to shout afterwards. My cup running over. Surely goodness and mercy. All those wonderful. God gives you a provision, but you ask for it as a promise, but you got to walk through a problem in order to get through your provision. Am I preaching to you today? Some of you are saying, God, I just want that provision from that promise. But you got a process you got to walk through. You got a problem and some challenges you have to walk through. But my God will supply all your needs. The reason you're here is to trust God. You may not be able to understand him, but you got to trust him. Trust in the Lord. Lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. Pressure is great being a valor college, but the reward is so much greater. Stop looking at the pressure and look towards the reward. Who for the joy was set before him, endured the cross, despised the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. He did not have his eyes on the pain. He had his eyes on the reward. Your reward is when you graduate and God has installed in you the Spirit. There's an impartation on this house. I'm telling you, there's a radical, bold anointing in this house. God is not raising you up just to do something little small and little pious. If you're here, it's because you're a world changer. If you're here, it's because God's got a destiny on your life. That's why you've been fighting what you've been fighting, because the devil don't want you to keep on keeping on. 
but you got to keep on keeping on. You got to push through the muck. You got to push through the mire. You got to push through all the pain and all the stress. If there was no fight, it wouldn't be worth it, ladies and gentlemen. You got to fight the good fight of faith. It's called a fight for a reason. You got to get your hands up and you got to start slinging and slaying and uppercutting and jabbing and do what you got to do to let the devil know I'm not going to be taken out. My best days are ahead. I am a deliverer and I'm going to be used by God. Shout, I've got a fight in me. There's going to be days that you're going to wake up and say, I don't feel like fighting. And those are the days that God's looking at you and he's testing you and seeing will you fight even if you don't feel like it. Will you fight when your body's saying don't fight? Will you fight when your mind is saying don't fight? Will you fight when your finances are saying don't fight? And you want to give up and you want to give in and you want to quit. But don't get weary in well-doing for a due season will come if you keep on keeping on. Deliverers understand, they understand that I am not here to impress, but to empower. Deliverers understand that ministry is not all about the glory, but it's everything to do with God. Ministers understand that I'm not trying to be understood. I'm here speaking on behalf of God. If we need anything right now, we need deliverers. We need preachers, ladies and gentlemen. This is the year, this is the season where God is raising up preachers. People who will cry aloud. Spare not. Lift up their voice. John the Baptist was a voice in the wilderness. Do you know when your voice is formed? Your voice, when you were inside your mom, your voice was on eight or nine weeks. It was the same time your fingerprint was formed. That means your, your voice is not just a voice, but it is your identity. No one has your voice. No one has your voice. My kids can say, Dad, and I will turn around and I will know that's my daughter, that's my son. I can be in a mall and four or five people say, Dad, and I'll keep walking because I don't recognize their voice. Everybody has a voice and God gave you your voice so that you could lift up your voice. God could have walked into Egypt and just unlocked the doors and said, I want my people to go. Could have struck Pharaoh dead, but he chose to use a deliverer. God uses people. God chooses people. And he puts them through stuff so that he can test them. It says, count it all joy when you fall into tests and trials. Why do I count it all joy? that I'm going through a test because the test is not there to demote you. The test is there to promote you. Anytime you're in school and you take a test, it's because it's getting you to the next chapter. You are in a test and it's because God is promoting you to another place. God has an anointing that he's putting inside of you. Stand to your feet. How do you become? How can I be what God has called me to be? How can I deliver what God has called me to deliver? You got to have a stay put anointing. So many people want it so sudden so quick great skyscrapers are built 
in years. Houses are built in months. I seen this on social media. <clears throat> and if you've seen it, that's fine. Just bear with me. But this dog and this elephant, they get pregnant at the same time. The dog has a litter of puppies, about seven or eight. The dog gets pregnant again, has another litter of puppies, five or six. Elephant is still pregnant. The dog gets pregnant again, has a litter of about five. Finally, the dog goes to the elephant and says, didn't we get pregnant at the same time a long, ago, long time ago? And I've already had about 15 babies. You haven't even had yours yet. And the elephant said, I know that. But when my baby comes out, it shakes the ground. And that spoke to me. Because the best thing you could do is stay. Hold on. Because there's something that God is impregnating with you. That is so great. You're a deliverer. People are not going to understand the fire in you. But they're not going to deny it either. God is raising up preachers that have conviction, that have compassion, that are living true for God. And don't give away your authentic genuineness. One thing I felt this morning is the genuineness that's in this house. That's a hard price to pay. But when you're genuine and authentic, people see that more than they see your gift. Your gift will bless people more than it does anything for God. It makes a way for people. But after the gift, if you're going to stay there, it's going to take character, authenticity, genuineness. I'm so tired of fake people, y'all. I can't stand it. I was going to be honest with you. I'm so tired of fake people. You can't deliver anything when you're fake. Y'all ever, ever see that on television? You see, you know, when they have a set, they'll have a fire in the background. You're like, man, that's a really cool fire. And you get close to it, and it's just a little piece of paper doing that. How many know what I'm talking about? And here's how you can tell. When you get close to it, Number two, it doesn't create any warmth or heat. There's no flame. It just looks the part. But there's nothing that comes from it that does any benefit. And the closer you get to it, the more fake it becomes. God is looking for fresh fire, not fake fire. You're here to get a fresh fire. Elijah, and I'm done after this. Elijah was a deliverer. And he spoke to the, the prophets of Baal. And he said, I want you to go on your mountain. I'll go on mine. You know the story. Wave your hand if you know the story. You call out to your God. I'll call out to my God. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. So we will define who God is by the fire. Deliverers are defined by the fire they carry. He said, I want you to go do your thing, and then I'll do my thing. They all got up on the mountain. They got up here, and they put the altar, and they put the sacrifice, and they called out. There was no fire. They started dancing, asking for the fire. No fire. The Bible says they were leaping. No fire. They were shouting, no fire. Finally, Elijah said, where's your God? You're leaping, you're shouting, you're dancing, you're doing all these things, but there's no fire. And it's a lot of churches like that, ladies and gentlemen. We leap, we shout, we dance, but there's no fire. Elijah says this, and watch, it's very, very key. Elijah goes and gets an altar. He pours water on the altar. He gives a sacrifice on the altar. And this is what the prophet Elijah said. And here is where the key is. If you want to be one of the greatest deliverers on the face of the earth, you got to know this last key. He comes to God and he tells God, he said, I am your servant. I'm asking for fire. Here's the thing. 
He wasn't, in everybody else's eyes, a servant. He was the prophet. But when he came to God, he was a servant. Because deliverers understand this one thing. We can have all our titles down here, ladies and gentlemen. But to God, you have one title. I'm a servant. And the true meaning of ministry is diakonos. It means to serve. I don't care what you do. If it's not a serving aspect to God, it's really not ministry. That's why when you sing, you preach, or you greet, or you do anything, do it as unto the Lord. Or you're going to be confused all your life because you're going to be looking for praises from people. And they didn't give you your calling. They didn't pick you. They didn't choose you when you're on the back side of the desert and everybody else has forgotten about you. God will humble you with nothing and then he'll humble you with everything. God will give you nothing and see will you worship me. Just like David had nothing and he'll strip everything. And if you have everything, he'll strip everything to nothing because he wants to humble you with nothing. And I'm not talking about material. I'm talking about a mindset. Because if God is really going to use you, he'll take everything away from you so that you can say, God, I I only have you I'm not where I am today because it was all pretty I'm in where I am today because God stripped everything from me and he said I'm gonna use you because if you keep carrying stuff into your new season all that baggage all that junk God can't use you Abraham had to separate from Lot, and the moment he did he said get out of your tent and look from where you are stop looking at where you are and start looking from where you are and you can't look from where you are you can't be a deliverer for God if you're constantly bringing baggage from your last season into your new season and saying God I want you to bless it God don't it's not gonna bless a mess ladies and gentlemen you got to get rid of some stuff you got to shave some stuff off of you he'll cut you he'll do things because he's trying to produce more fruit everything he puts you through is to bless you and the quicker you understand that, the more you'll say, I thank you, God. I'm walking through this because there's on the other side of this, there's some major anointing miracles going to happen. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that everything's going to be just peachy king. God didn't, he never said that. He said, walk the fight of faith. He said, press into the kingdom. But I will tell you what's awesome is, is if you stay pure before God, there's nothing like having such a relationship with him that when he says, let my people go and you speak it out and all of a sudden the blood is applied, you're going to walk out with silver and gold. All these one, 430 years went because one person sent as a deliverer brought people out and in 24 hours, what 430 years of slavery happened one man did it in 24 hours because he trusted God. And we look at that. We look at Moses. He's the guy that split the Red Sea. He's the guy that brought him out. He's the guy that was up on the mountain. He got the Ten Commandments. But we don't see the Moses in Midian. The 40 years of preparation, the testing and the trying to see what is in your heart before I can use you when he was drawn out of the water as a deliverer. And that's why you're at Valor College, because they're drawing you out. They're bringing something out of you that everybody else may not see. And so you stand strong and you say, God, I want you to get everything from me. Close your eyes. If I'm talking to you, would you wave your hand right now? I want you to come to this front right now. Come to this front. Come. Used to be an old song. I don't know if you know it. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary pure and holy like this right here tried and true with thanksgiving with I'll be a living sanctuary sanctuary for you I will. I want you to lift your hands and I want you to sing it again. Say it, Lord, Lord, be a sanctuary, God, a place where you reside. 
pure and holy yes tried and true oh come on and say it with thanksgiving I want to be a living, yes I do God uses people to do his purpose. That's why you can't blame the evil that's in the world on God. We're the ones that have dominion. So if God is going to change how this nation or nations go, it's going to be because he's got some deliverers that know how to bring people out. What will God do in the next 10 years because you spent the last 10 minutes saying, God, make me everything you've called me to be. I believe you're a deliverer tonight. I believe you're a, this morning. I believe you're a preacher this morning. I believe you're a crier. You cry aloud, spare not, lifting up your voice like a trumpet. I believe every single person in here today on the sound of my voice has the anointing has the ability to move forward and an assignment that God has for you. And you have to say, God, I trust you. I will fulfill my assignment. Every assignment that you have, every assignment that you have, God will not give you another one unless you complete the first, the, the one you're at. Your assignment now is to be tried, to be in valor, to have God pull things out. Don't you give up. Don't you quit. Don't you be weary. Go back with the strength of the Lord and say, I'm thanking you, God, that you're installing something in me that will never, ever leave me. I am 44 years old, and the stuff that hit me at 18, 19, and 20 in this building is still inside of me. Don't you give up. And don't mess with the world right now. Be ye separate because you are a minister of the gospel. Lift your hands. I want you to take yourself seriously. If you need to get rid of some stuff, you need to repent, you need to get some stuff off of you. If you need some stuff you need to get out in the open, go ahead. Just like it was said, some of us had a hard time worshiping a minute ago because we have so much junk attached to our worship. If there's some stuff you need to get rid of, if there's some stuff that nobody knows, there's only two people that know everything about you, and that's you and God. If you and God still have some business to take care of, would you do it right now? Would you do it right now? Come on, don't worry about who's watching, who's looking, who's seeing right now. The most important thing you can do is get your vessel clean. I get rid of it. I get rid of it. What good is it going to do if you can impress everybody, but you go home and you know the stuff that you're dealing with? Get rid of it right now. It doesn't belong in you. You're called by God. You're chosen by God. Ministries flowing through your blood. God has an assignment for you. You're going to have faith, and God's going to use you in a great way, but you cannot fool yourself. Get rid of it. 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 Sometimes you just got to spiritually throw up on yourself and say, I am so sick of this in me. I feel generational curses coming off of you right now. Stuff that your mom and your dad dealt with. Stuff that you've been dealing with. It's coming off of you. There's some people right now getting delivered from pornography. Your eyes have seen so much. And you're saying, God, I just want free from this addiction. I speak it off of you right now. Don't you worry about who's watching. It don't matter. They did not choose you. God chose you, and the devil knew it. That's why he put addictions on you. I break and I bind that spirit of addiction through the anointing of Jesus Christ. It is off of you right now. I'm preaching to some preachers here. There's some deliverers in the house, and God is purging you. Oh, 
you where I But I might not be your soul Whatever you gotta do If you gotta fall down If you got whatever you gotta do Don't you leave this sanctuary Don't you leave this anointing Still holding on to stuff Take your stuff, bring it to the altar Tie it down and 